Holy moly, it gets more creative every time I see this. I never know what David's going to be throwing up at the beginning of the show. Anyway, that's David Markland, our uh, sure-handed director and uh, running all the, the knobs and things. I appreciate it. He's always trying to surprise us. That countdown reminded me of the Hulk or something. Maybe it's a hangover from yesterday's uh, interview we did with the X-Men people. Anyway, today we've got a really interesting podcast. Uh, longtime acquaintance and friend Jonathan Mayberry is here to talk about two new novels, uh, some interesting things in the magazine world, and uh, I have some questions about the book industry and writing in general I think we want to go over. Also, if during this you have a question, a comment, be sure to type it in and let us know. It'll come up on my screen and uh, we'll talk about it and see what we come up with. But for the meantime, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Mayberry. Hey, Dell, and hello to everybody watching. It's uh, nice to virtually you know, be in the room with you guys. It's nice to do this without wearing a mask. This is true, though, though I... I, my, my, my wingman has his mask on. <laughs> That's good to have. This is a, here we are in the middle of a pandemic and it's a pretty exciting month for you. It is, it is. And um, I'm kind of disturbed to be living in the plot of one of my novels, but um, this is <laughs> pretty much what it is. But yeah, it's, uh, November's been a crazy month. I have two novel releases and a magazine that I've edited out this month. And it's, uh, there aren't, aren't a lot of months like that. No, but are we culminating other releases from earlier in the year? I know you're going to come by Dark Delicacies in a in a week or so and sign the new novel and things, but uh, I brought in a bunch of back stock. This isn't your first release this year, though, right? No, no. I've, I've had uh, I had a graphic novel, Pandemica, release, which is about a pandemic that sweeps across America, and there's you know, disinformation from the government and all that. It's, it sounds weirdly like I'm writing it now, but I actually wrote it two years ago. It just happened to come out now. And who um, is it from? IDW Comics. Okay. And, um, uh, it was be beautifully illustrated and, and uh, it, it had a great time with it. It's five issue mini, complete mini series in one graphic novel now. And um, also uh, one of my favorite editing projects came out this year, Don't Turn Out the Lights, which is a, the official tribute to scary stories to tell in the dark. Has 35 writers in it, you know, amazing list of writers, uh, great illustrations, and um, it just came out in hard hardcover uh, about a month and a half ago from HarperCollins. Right, I have that one in Dark Delicacies, and it's got that eerie green yeah. on it, uh, like David was throwing up on the beginning of the show here. It's <laughs> uh, and it's predominantly because it's like scary stories. It's a uh, YA tilted, right? Yeah, it's more middle grade. It, it skews a little younger than YA. Um, and their their story most of the stories are short. They can be read in just a couple of minutes. They're a little longer than flash fiction, but not much. But there are also a couple of longer stories to kind of introduce younger readers to the the, the standard short story format. And they're all creepy and they're all fun and uh, does not always end well for the characters. Which is is this, uh, is this a good campfire book? Yeah, it's well. That, that's what that's what scary stories to tell in the dark. Al, Alvin Schwartz's books were. They were intended as campfire stories. And we kept to that that uh, style because, you know, it is, it is the official tribute to, to Alvin Schwartz. And, and uh, we wish he was still alive writing more of those uh, books. And was this done through the uh, auspices of Horror Writers Association? It is my, my second official uh, anthology of the Horror Writers Association. The first was YA. It was called Scary Out There. It came out a few years ago from, from Simon & Schuster. But, yeah, this is a Horror Writers Association anthology. And uh, everyone in it is a horror is is a member of the Horror Writers Association, and um, it's it's fun to to be playing with my friends in that very creepy playground. Oh yeah, that's it's it's always good to have. These are also has some writers in it that haven't been published before, right? Um, a couple of new newbie writers, but um, some of them have been published in small press or or even some were indie press before they they uh, came into our group. And we also have writers who are, you know, major New York Times bestsellers. And sure. interesting, not all of the writers in it are actual horror writers. Like we have Jamie Ford and uh, Luis Alberto Urea, who are more literary uh, writers. But I know they're they're privately horror geeks, so I invited them in to tell stories as well. And of course, you know, it's anchored by R.L. Stein, who wrote a, a story for it that that is just delicious. 
he's a great guy too. He's come to several of the conventions and things like that. I and noticed Bob, right behind your right shoulder too. Yeah, and Bob's the, the the funniest guys I ever met, which is really crazy. But yeah, right behind my left shoulder is is Lost Roads. It's the Lost Roads. Yeah, the seventh and currently final book in the Rotten Ruin series. Final meaning that I wrap up the story pretty well. Um, but it's the second book in it's, like it's, this kind of tale, right? It's a spinoff of this main Rotten Ruin story uh, called the Broken Land series, but it really is, it does wrap up the storylines begun in the first book. So all the characters from the first Rotten Ruin books are in this, but there's also a new cast of characters. And it's, and unlike the first series, which is set in Southern Cal in Central California, this is set in South Texas. And, um, we get to see another group that thinks they're the only people left alive during the zombie apocalypse and you know the, the collision of of the the original characters and their characters and a big slam bam ending i had a lot of fun with that book how long has this series taken to publish out uh, about 10 years uh, yeah. it's been about 10 years now and uh the, Rot the original Rotten Ruin book is also in development for film at Alcon Entertainment. The people who did uh, Blade Runner 2049 and Book of Eli um, and the Expanse TV show, they're actually, uh, they have a, they're in second draft of a, of a brilliant script by one of the Marvel screenwriters. Can't tell you who yet, but you know, but you'll, you'll recognize the movie he made. And um, we're really excited that, that they're, it looks like they're doing it really right too. You know, exactly the way they should. Well, that's kind of nice. In fact, we're going to get in a little bit into page to screen a little bit later in the conversation, too. I think that's important for you. But I don't want to miss the other book that's being released this month. There it is. Look. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We all have our copies. And this is a standalone. Where did this come from? Well, um, it's a standalone with a, with links to other books, but it's it's, a, it's self a standalone. The premise of it is there's a... Uh, a type of, I guess you can almost call him a vampire who doesn't drink blood, but he feeds on memories. But specifically, he's able to steal the tattoo from your body that is attached to an important memory. Like one character has the tattoo of her dead daughter on, on her hand. And after he brushes it, the tattoo begins to fade from her and appear on his hand. And he feeds on the intensity of the memories. And what makes it worse is as he feeds on that memory, that the person who had it loses the memories. So the character eventually forgets everything about her dead daughter. Which so is the memories just transfer. Oh, yeah, completely transfer. And then he consumes them and they're gone from him. So there's no way to actually reclaim them. It's a pretty disturbing sort of villain. And yeah. I did a lot of research in the tattoo culture to make sure I, I, uh, I understood that, you know, I'm not, a, I don't have tattoos myself, but I interviewed 300 people in the tattoo culture um, and uh, got some amazing stories, some of which I was able to fold into the story, into the book. Now, when you're writing something like this, do you know whether it may continue as a series or not? Uh, or sometimes you do and sometimes you don't? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm typically a series writer. I, I've, I have a bunch of different series, the Joe Ledger, the Rotten Ruin, the Dead of Night. Uh, right. Night. I love series work, but I have done the occasional standalone. And instead of this having this becoming a series, which it's not going to because it, it resolves that story within that book, there are characters that appear in different standalones. So in my novel Glimpse that came out two years ago, there were supporting characters, Monk Addison and, and Patty Cakes. Patty Cakes is the nickname of a tattoo artist. And um, so they were supporting characters in Glimpse, which was a standalone, but they're the main characters of this book, which is a standalone. And there are also characters from my, my Pine Deep trilogy, which was my first three novels. Um, they're in there as supporting characters. So the, the, the story isn't a series but certain characters kind of wander in and out of my different books. And uh, that's a lot of fun for me to do. When you wrote Glimpse, did, and did you know ink was going to come at that time or did the characters tell you this was going to come? No, what happened is I, I the, the character of Monk Addison who was in Glimpse, I had written several short stories, four short stories about him. And I, I kept looking for the right novel for him. And he's, you know, tattoos are a big part of his story in a very creepy way. Um, so when I uh, decided I wanted to do another standalone, I thought, well, you know, who, who is, who's the most interesting character I have that I want to put in the standalone? I realized it was Monk and 
tattoos, how to be a part of it. And I start cooking up ideas and bang, I come up with the idea for, for ink. And that's one of those things that when it popped into my head, it came fully formed. I knew the entire story. Do you, do you find it in general, of course, we're talking because nothing is all the time. Do you find it easier to outline and work on stories if you know they're part of a series because you have a long vision of it or um, – because you're an outliner, right? You're not a pantser, as they say. I'm definitely a, plot, a plotter. Yeah. Um, all of my books are pretty easy for me to outline. I, I'm, I'm very much a structure guy. Um, I even outline my short stories. So I'm, I'm very much a structure person. I want to know how it's going to end. So Did that I, come from the academic world? It come from uh, be, being trained as a journalist, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I, I often would write the end of my articles before I would start and write the article itself. I do that with my fiction too. I, you know, like I'll write the first chapter, I'll write the last few chapters and then kind of write in between. But I, I know the whole story and I want to know that so I can build in motif and subplot, lay clues and so on. And uh, so, yeah, I, I like I liked knowing the entire structure and whether it's series or standalone, plotting it out, it's the same process for me. And each book, even in a series, should be unique to itself so it's not like it's just, you know, rinse and repeat from the last book in the series. And if somebody happens to buy the third book first, they read it as a complete story, right? Yeah. yeah. They're not lost because they're on book three. No, no. In fact, um, the only, even my first books, which was intended as a trilogy, they were released without it saying book one, two, and three on the cover. So right. people were buying second and third book and feeling that they had a whole story. But at the same time, there were things that – were alluded to and they're like, well, what was that? And then they find out it was a series. I think uh, when I first met you, which was at the Javits Center during one of the uh, BEA conventions, yeah. you had a table right near the entrance and you were pushing Ghost Road Blues at that time, I believe. It was Dead Man's Song, the second book in the series. Second book in the series. So that would have been 2007. Yeah, it's yeah. been a while. <laughs> Crazy. I actually broke into fiction only in 2006. Uh, before that, I was writing fiction, nonfiction part-time and teaching martial arts a during the day. And some of the, non the nonfiction you were writing was horror-oriented. Yeah, I, I did a nonfiction book um, around 1999, I think it was, under a pen name, Shane MacDougall, um, called The Vampire Slayer's Field Guide to the Undead, which was a an exploration of supernatural predators, vampires, werewolves, and so on, around the world and throughout history. And I was actually writing that book, researching that book, that, that kind of sparked my interest in maybe trying fiction to, to build some of the folkloric versions of monsters into fiction. Because very few, uh, especially back then, um, very few novels used the folkloric versions of, of these monsters. Most of them retread the Hollywood versions, which are not at all like the folkloric versions. And right. uh, I wanted to explore that. So eventually, by 2000. I guess around uh, two, I started you know, getting in, in gear to write my first novel. Thought it was just going to be a one shot, get it out of my system and it'd be done. And now I'm writing my 40th novel. So apparently it was what I should have been doing all along. Well, you're prolific. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Of course, some of that has to do with like, I like paying the bills too. But um, yeah. Yeah. being prolific also does it, does it pose certain problems on you in that uh, – publishing companies or editors or even your agent expect a book every so often and there's a pressure to do that? Yeah, but I'm okay with the pressure. I like the fast lane. You know, I I, I think if, if I had been a professional driver, I would have been a race car driver. I love, I like the fast lane. Um, my agent is one of those people. She's wonderful. I've been with, that's my first agent. I'm still with her. Um, she will sell anything I, I give her. And, um, she doesn't ever tell me that I need to slow down. Uh, as far as editors go, because I write in so many different genres, I write horror, thriller, science fiction, fantasy, mystery. Um, and so many grade levels. Yeah, and, and different grade levels. The, by writing multiple books a year, they don't compete with one another. They're not in the same market. So I actually write for several different publishers and several imprints of different publishers without the books competing. And I, you know, I managed to get it done. Like right now, I'm writing my fifth novel of this year. I've written four novels already this year. Ink, I actually wrote Ink this year, uh, beginning of the year. And, um, you know, that's the lane I like. I like I like write, writing fast. It's when I, I do my best work when I write fast. 
Do you remember what your wife looks like? <laughs> I do. I, 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 I write nine to five and I, I knock off and then it's family time. You do it like a regular job. That's the, job. Yeah. And th yeah. that's, that's the thing. I, I'm not one of those writers who mythologize the process. I don't need to wait for the muse to whisper in my ear, get my ass out of bed, you know, eat breakfast, get whatever. And then at nine o'clock, I'm at my job at my desk and I write, I work my whole day. I average three to 4,000 words a day. And that includes, by the way, interviews, includes nonfiction, you know, articles and so on, right. includes whatever business I need to do. And right now, one of the things, you know, is I'm, I've got to build in time for book promotion and build in time for uh, pitching to TV studios for something. Well, yeah, when, when a writer says I spend eight hours a day writing, it's not really eight hours a day writing. It isn't. No, it's, it, and there's a lot of research, day. like like yeah. you did with the tattoos. Yeah, research is a big part of it. And uh, luckily with social media, I'm able to reach a, a lot more people more quickly. And so like with Inc., I created a question set and put out social media. You know, if you're a tattoo person, I'd like to interview you, got flooded with responses and it's just cut and paste the questions. And um, then, you know, plow through the answers. You I usually go through the responses to that off, you know, off the clock. Right. I'm relaxing, but... Um, I, being efficient is part of the job and, you know, one likes to grow one's business and you only can do that well if your process is, is tight. Now talking about page to screenplay, um, do you find it maybe that you get more interest in screenplays from a graphic novel than you do from a straight novel because the people who are buying it look at it more as a storyboard kind of in their head? There, there is a lot of that. Um, most of the, the comics I've done, though, have been for uh, other people's licenses. Like, I did a lot of work for Marvel. And, you know, so... Wolverine not, and stuff, I remember, Wolverine, yeah. Black, Black Panther, Captain America, you know. So, so I don't have the rights to sell that to, to the screen. Right. Um, there is the possibility that my, my run on Black Panther, which involved Shuri as the Panther, not T'Challa, may influence or maybe part of the next Black Panther film. But again, it's not me selling that. However, with V Wars, the show I had on Netflix this year, that was both a series of books and comics. And it was an anthology. You were you might have had stories in there, but you were the editor. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a little a little more than just being an editor. It's it, it's a shared world anthology. I wrote a 40,000 word framing story for each book, each volume. And then I invited other writers to come in and write individual stories. The TV series was based about 75% on my framing story. And the rest drew on, on elements from Nancy Holder and um, John Everson, who had written stories in there. So it, it embraced some of their work as well. It's really fantastic stuff, the characters they created. Now, was anything else that the studios have considered been an anthology of yours? Or have they all been things that were entirely your work? Uh, there's one I can't mention which it is because you know we're still in the pitch. But one of the anthologies nobody's I did, listening. <laughs> well, one, of, one of the anthologies I did. Um, we are sh actively shopping to studios right now. We, we actually did our our uh, third or fourth pitch yesterday, and we have another one coming up. And um, uh, I have a, a, an actor friend who's working with me and two producing partners. And the actor and I are actually doing the actual pitch, which is kind of fun doing it through Zoom. I love pitching. But that's based on an anthology. But it's not a standard anthology in the way our TV show is going to be because instead of just doing an episode per week based on a story, there are going to be characters that are through lines that will be in each episode um, so that like sometimes they're supporting characters, sometimes they're lead character. But the actual content of each episode is based on one of the stories um, that was in the book. So has everything uh, on screen-wise been uh, stuff that was – for streaming as opposed to, you know, big screen movie kind of thing? Well, Rotten Ruin is is being developed by Alcon as a big screen film. Um, you know, it's definitely going to be a feature film. Now they um, own the series to do that or just the first book or? They optioned, they optioned the whole series. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to, the, the idea, their plan is to do one movie per book, which, you know, if that works out, that's, I'm a big fan. Uh, but I, <laughs> I, I tend to have a bias toward TV because I like to follow characters and go deeper into them. Um, so I, I tend to watch more TV than, uh, than I watch movies. Um, right. But so I've got uh, a glimpse was optioned for TV because they the producers who, who got that 
One was the producer from uh, the Equalizer films, uh, Tony Eldridge. The other is Janet Zucker, who is uh, the wife of Jerry Zucker, who did Airplane and Ghost uh, and so on. Very um, serious dramas, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, she's, she's a little more, she's less comedic than her, than her husband. Um, but they're, they're, they want to get the Monk Addison character and try to develop a TV series out of them. My Joe Ledger series and Pine Deep series, are, are, are we, we just got an option offer on those for TV. So I tend to, to skew a little bit more toward TV. Not that I don't like film, but right. my stuff tends to lend itself more to a TV uh, series than, than a, a two hour film. Well, and the beauty of the TV series is that you've got the, uh, it can be four episodes, eight episodes. It can yep. be one season, three seasons. I mean, there, there are so many options to play with there. Yeah, and I've I've a number of friends who whose uh, books have become TV series, like Charlene Harris with True Blood, right. uh, Lindsay with Dexter. Um, you know, I, I I I love being able to see the characters become fully alive, see them evolve, and also I'm not a prima donna about my work, so you know if they want to adapt it and make some changes that work better on screen than, than the version that I have in print, I'm okay with that because the print version is still here. Right. Um, I, I don't necessarily need a completely faithful adaptation. I want to see the version of it that works best on big or small screen. Well, when you're writing the novel, you're not necessarily thinking how it looks on screen, even though I know when I write, I see it playing in my head. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I even dreamcast my stuff. Um, yeah, oh, of course, I think we all do that, yeah. And I also, you know, when I'm doing my outline, it tends to be a lot like a storyboard because I... I I'm very visual. I'm an artist myself. So, you know, I, I tend to, to see stories. Um, I see scenes and see, see characters. And I want that to play out, you know, uh, in the in my print, but I also want to see it in my head. So I, I'm there is a, a bit of um, a, a bit of the movie or TV version going on in my head as I'm plotting and as I'm writing. You're not possessive though, like that's my baby. You can't change my baby. Nope. I'm not that guy. <laughs> uh, because the thing is. My baby is the book, and that's not going to change. Right. Um, if people like the show, they'll, they'll read the book. If people want to read the book without seeing the show, that's fine. And if they like the show but don't read the book, I'm still getting paid for the show. So there's no downside to it at all. No, you, know? you can just make yourself a nuisance, and then they don't buy from you again. Then. Yeah, and and actually, I this is one of the things I lecture on with to writers is, you know, uh, Ray Bradbury gave me his Ten Commandments of how to be a great writer when I was 13 years old. He said, "Kid, here's the Ten Commandments: Don't be a jackass. Don't be a jackass. Don't be a." You know. <laughs> and I try, I try to live up to Ray's advice. I try not right. to be a jackass. No, yep, that's what you have to do. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting, though. I want to talk for just a second before we run out of time here, because this wow. is flying past us. I want to talk about the publishing industry sure. because news came down this week that um, Penguin slash Random House may be bidding for Simon and Schuster. And the whole idea about another step of consolidation has got to be troubling for authors. It is. It is. And I've been publishing with Simon and Schuster for, for 10 years. Um, uh, I, I I like there to be the, the the different houses, the many different houses, because first off, for a writer, I mean that, that that's where you get the best deals because your agent then can play one off the other and, and so on. And also, having separation allows for identity within within the, each each company, their view of what publishing is, their view of what makes a good book, and so on. Uh, I don't want there to eventually be one publishing house. I want to build right. publishing houses. So I'm not a fan of that of that um, that news. No, and and when you anytime you lose options, that's that's a bad move. It's not the same. Somebody said, well, look, like uh, a random house might have ten imprints. Not the same thing. No, no, it's not. Um, though there are times imprints within a company can can be fun. I mean, like Tour and St. Martin's Griffin are both Macmillan imprints, and right. they both do similar types of books. So there's a little bit of a back and you know a little bit of a war, sometimes even a bidding war within their two imprints. That can be fun, but still, I do like the 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 the, the different nations within publishing. I think that it makes for a healthier publishing environment overall. Absolutely. Um, one other thing, of course, we want to mention is you were one of the founders of the Writer's Coffee House. Yep. And and um, that started in Pennsylvania before you moved out here. Yeah, and then uh, there's still 
the different chapters, as you know, of course, we ran one at, at uh, Dark Delicacies with Peter Kleins mm -hmm. doing the moderating, but they still are kind of meeting online. But how does that work out? It's for those who don't know, it's where writers get together for a couple of hours because it's kind of a solitary job, in case you didn't know. And they talk, they discuss, they help solve each other's problems. And usually the moderator uh, picks a subject and and pontificates on it. Yeah, I started these uh, about 18 years ago in Pennsylvania because after classes, I used to run a writer's center in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And after classes, people just hang around and talk to each other. This is really before the social media era got, got, got cooking. And um, I realized that, that they were just hungry f to talk to others of their kind, people who understood what they're doing, understood their challenges and so on. And, and collectively, they had more information than any of anybody had individually. So I made it official, made it credit the Writers Coffee House. We have 19 of them in different parts of the country right now, all inactive in terms of the physical version. But I still run the San Diego chapter and we still have a monthly meeting. We do it via Zoom. You know, mm -hmm. I... I have people sign up for it. There's a hundred of us get together on Zoom once a month. And uh, we, we don't bash. We're not critiquing each other's work. We talk about the craft of writing, the business of publishing. Anything is, is fair game. Usually at the beginning, who, those of us who are in the biz talk a little bit about what's going on in the biz. And then we right. open discussion questions. And then I just moderate the discussion. That's the way it is. And usually something spins off from that because, you know, I remember sitting in the ones up, up here in Burbank and they would, somebody would say something and it would just trigger something in somebody else. I'm having a problem like that, but not exactly. And then it goes off in these weird directions. Yeah. And it's, it's great too, because I mean, the collective knowledge in any group is, is fantastic and underappreciated. And, and we, we really play with that dynamic. Uh, absolutely love that uh, that process and by the way it is oh, we have a facebook page um writer's coffee house and it's open to everyone it's free and you know anyone anywhere can join uh because it's just writers helping writers you don't even need to have been published if you just pick up a pen that day and say i wonder what this does you're a writer you're welcome yeah uh, people used to ask me do i do i need to have been published i know this peter klein's guy has got you know best selling this and that. I said, you can write in your diary. We don't care. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the sharing. The only requirement for publishing is the people who run each chapter need to be published so right. that they have an inside track on the, on the business. But the membership is really anyone and in fiction, nonfiction, diary, memoir, you know, whatever it is, come and join us. Be among people of your own species because we're... And so many of them wanted to learn how to write and how to express themselves, right. which is why they hadn't done it yet. And they felt they felt a friendship in those groups. Yeah. And also, we try to break through the propaganda that, that gets in a lot of writers' way. People believe the concept that writer's block is a thing, which is not a thing. It's, it you know, and we explain why it's not a thing. And um, we really try to promote a lot of goodwill between writers as opposed to writer bashing, which you never need to stand on somebody that you knock down in order to be visible, you know, you right. should all be lifting each other up. Well, you know, I've always, I, I've always thought that we're not in any kind of competition with each other. No, really? I think of writing, like playing golf, I'm trying to get a better score each time. It doesn't matter what you're doing on the links. Yeah. And, and, you know, if more good books are written, uh, more People, more books will be sold, more readers will be attracted to this larger number of good books, and we all prosper. There's no downside to cooperation. That's absolutely right. And boy, could the society use that right about now. Yeah, but we're not going there, John. We're not. <laughs> so, is Writer's Coffee House actually a spin off of the Liars Club in no, some the, way? Liars Club came after. Liars Club, after we had I'd started the Writer's Coffee House uh, and had met a bunch of, of uh, professional writers, we, we realized that we could probably help each other on a more, you know, day-to-day -day level. Um, and Gregory Frost, the fantasy writer, he and I founded the, uh, the Liars Club. Um, but now the Writers Coffee House has been handed over to the Liars Club and they oversee most of the, uh, the chapters, not all of them, most of the chapters. And uh, Liars Club, we originally started to help each other. And then during the economic downturn of 2008 and 9, we, we, we shifted to, to supporting independent bookstores and libraries who were really getting hit hard economically. And, and we do a lot of stuff for those groups, to independent uh, 
bookstores, independent publishing, um, conventional publishing, writers of all kinds, libraries. That that's our that's the people we're trying to help, and we we've spent the last you know. Um, 14, 12, 14 years doing that and having fun doing it. That's great. And uh, we need more than that. Uh, we need everybody to get on board with that kind of thing. And, and I need to uh, do one more plug for this beauty right here. Stand alone. Um, but if you've read a lot of Jonathan's stuff, you may recognize a few names, characters, and that sort of thing in here. It's yep. a lot of fun. Um, thank and, and you for people, being Yeah, and people, please remember that I'll be at Dark Delicacies on Monday signing books. So if you want to order a, a you know a book and get it signed, go order from the store because I'll be there on Monday and I'm going to, I'm going to be signing anything that you order. That's true. And the store is actually closed on Monday because we're not allowed to have groups, which Jonathan seems to draw them. I don't know what it is. So uh, he has to come in on a day we're closed, sign the books that have been pre-ordered. So jump on the Dark Delicacy site and pre-order the book. We have ink. And we also have roads, back, lost roads back there. Um, you can order any of those. So, And in fact, if you call us on the phone, we have a lot of his back stock, yeah. including the uh, this year's anthology from middle grade. Uh, that, uh, Ultra is, Mountain Lights. Yeah. A, a nice green, eerie cover, dark kind of fun thing. So it's a good Christmas present, actually, for, for the kids. So thank you very much for being on here, sir. Oh, I will see you in person on Monday. That'll be fun. And um, I don't care if you buy ink from us, just buy it. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Del. And th th thanks, everyone who's, who, who you know checked in with us. This is great. I appreciate it. And it's funny because this will be up on Facebook afterward. You can watch this. You don't have to have watched this in real time. And then in a day or so, it'll be up on our YouTube page. So you can always watch it afterwards. Thank you to David Marklin for uh, keeping us on track. And we'll see you next time. Take care, guys.